I know uh, the 5.30 time slot's usually not the premier time spot, and especially the 5.30 time spot in front of the cocktails and crimp is, is definitely not the prime spot. So, so I'll, I'll cut this down to about two hours, so, so we'll be good. So, all right, uh, again, I, I'm Dr. Brad Elias. I'm the, uh, the medical director of Jacksonville Fire Rescue. I've had the, the honor and privilege of being the medical director really since uh, 2014. Uh, at that time, it was actually a part-time position, uh, two days a week. Uh, in 2019, uh, City Hall made this a, a full-time uh, position, and, and you'll probably see why coming up. Uh, we're, we're quite busy, and then we're one of the larger fire departments in the country. So, so real quick, uh, not only am I a board-certified uh, EMS physician, I, I am a board-certified ER physician. I actually work for the emergency resource group which is the, uh, the ER group uh, based out of Baptist. So actually I do work clinically uh, with the NEMA and Dr. Hanel and, and the, the great stroke team. So I have that perspective as well. And uh, additionally, uh, the medical director of Life Flight, which is an EMS helicopter based out of Baptist South. Uh, the fire department, obviously our vision is, is talking about, uh, you know, improving uh, quality and, and serving uh, uh, the needs of the, the citizens of Jacksonville. Uh, and just like any major fire department, uh, our mission is to preserve and protect lives, property, and the environment. So a little bit about JFRD. Uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're, we're fairly sizable. We're one of the uh, larger metropolitan fire departments in the country. Our annual budget is uh, almost uh, $280 million uh, that comes through City Hall and then the mayor's office. Uh, we have 1,800 personnel of which 1,600 are uh, firefighters. And of that group, probably over 900 paramedics. So, so we're fairly sizable in that regard. We have 62 fire stations. We happen to be the largest all ALS fire department in the country. So that means that every apparatus, whether it's an engine, a ladder, a fireboat, has a paramedic on that apparatus and is capable of performing ALS interventions. Uh, you see we have 59 rescues uh, next month that will go up to 61 and we're adding two new uh, trucks those trucks actually will be enhanced capability or critical care uh, paramedic uh, type units uh, kind of with the uh, uh, you know adding paralytics uh, vent capability and the ability to initiate blood transfusion uh, on scene so something exciting we're working on right now uh, the service area is, is, again, one of the largest in the country, over uh, 918 square miles. Uh, Jacksonville has a population of approximately a million, which probably flexes to 1.2 million during the day with uh, uh, commuters. And again, just like any major metropolitan fire department, we have all the uh, subspecialty disciplines, obviously fire rescue, EMS, hazmat, uh, urban search and rescue, technical rescue, aircraft rescue, and all, all the others. Like I said, we, we are busy, and uh, the the mayor and his administration has recognized that. And we've, you know, over his time, uh, we've uh, undergone a significant expansion uh, in apparatus, personnel, and fire stations. And this is is why um, our calls for service last year were uh, 171,000, uh, with uh, approximately 147,000 EMS related calls. And we transported over 91,000 people to the hospitals uh, last year. You can see kind of a general trend uh, that's a, as an upward trend. COVID probably uh, resulted in a you know, continued increase in that. We did not see any kind of decrease uh, during uh, COVID, that was for sure. Uh, putting this into a national perspective, uh, we rank 12th or 13th in the nation in terms of uh, uh, busyness, uh, number of calls. So uh, again, back to the point, uh, we're one of the larger fire departments in the country. And so, you know, we're, we're pretty busy and, and, and as we'll see here, stroke, at least by the nature of the call, stroke is uh, only about 1.2%. Um, you see our, our top number, sick person is kind of a generic catch-all. Um, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, people don't really fall into a category, but chest pain, accidents, uh, breathing problems are, are major ones. But if you also look on this list, 
you'll see a number of neurologic conditions, obviously altered level of consciousness, seizure, headache, back pain, and then stroke too. So, you know, in terms of neurologic emergencies, uh, we, we do quite a bit of that. And obviously an altered level of consciousness could definitely turn into a stroke as same with a headache and, and such like that. So that's the, the calls as dispatched. When it comes to actually stroke alerts, right now, uh, as of last year, we had 1.6% uh, uh, of all transports were stroke alerts. Um, and you see that number has progressively gotten higher and, and kind of I'll explain that a little bit uh, uh, in some later slides. When I first uh, took over the medical direction, uh, in 2014, only 0.7% of the transports were stroke alerts. We've more than doubled that. That's probably multifactorial, but uh, clearly there's an emphasis on stroke recognition and, and bringing stroke patients to the right place. So, so where are we taking our stroke patients? Um, we're very fortunate here in Jacksonville to be uh, stroke center rich uh, within the city limits. Uh, essentially, we have four comprehensive stroke centers and five primary stroke centers, plus another six stroke center primary in Clay County, which uh, we actually go to on occasion. Uh, so you see the top four uh, percentage wise, those are all comprehensive stroke centers. Um, so we lean very heavily on, on the comprehensive stroke centers. This is a kind of a look back of over the last five years. For the most part, you know, again, we see a predominance that, that we rely heavily on the comprehensive stroke centers. Um, there has been a fairly significant uptick in, in the last year or so um, to all of the comprehensive stroke centers. We also have uh, standalone EDs uh, in the community, which we will not bring stroke alerts to. This is actually just a graphic again of that kind of rise and a fairly significant jump up in uh, uh, patients being transported to the comprehensive stroke centers. You see that the primary stroke center numbers really remain constant there around that, that kind of 200 range, uh, but uh, over 1200 strokes last year brought to comprehensive stroke centers. You kind of break this down again, kind of graph or numerically, uh, Baptist on average, probably getting uh, around 50 stroke alerts a month. Uh, Mayo gets uh, around 30. Uh, and so does uh, in UF also kind of our top three in terms of uh, stroke alert volume. Uh, we're now averaging even to this point this year, 146 stroke alerts a month. So we are bringing patients to these uh, stroke centers. Where a lot of this changed is we, we had a protocol change in uh, November of 20. So previous to that, we were averaging around 71 strokes a month. Uh, that was when we really changed the stroke assessment from fast to be fast. And there's another piece too that, that also changed. Um, and so as a result, we're seeing progressively increasing number of stroke alerts and also increasing number of transports of stroke alerts to the comprehensives. I apologize, this, this slide really doesn't come out too well. But so prior to 2020, uh, we were performing the, the FAST, uh, basically the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. I always had uh, uh, a favor of the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. I, I went to residency at UC. And so I was there in the late 90s with uh, the whole stroke team. And um, so I've, I've always been kind of a fan of the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. Uh, but then we did stroke to, to, you know, identify a stroke was the Cincinnati and then to identify the severity was the lamps. So we, we made a change in November of uh, 20. So we went from fast to be fast. Um, and then that was, you know, a, kind of a collaborative effort. We had talked to a number of the stroke centers, uh, obviously Baptist included. And, you know, there was a concern that we were missing these posterior, you know, circulation strokes. And so that we wanted to add that BE to the fast and, and hence uh, that came of uh, the transition from fast to be fast. We also, at, around that time, uh, there was some talk, uh, there, there were uh, discussions down in South Florida, they were no longer going to primary stroke centers. 
they were you know, going to purely go to comprehensive stroke centers. And I didn't feel, at least in Jacksonville, that was necessarily the, com the right thing to do. I didn't want to take out the primary stroke centers completely. But one of the kind of hybrid approaches uh, that I took was, was changing. We you know, continue to do LAMS, although historically LAMS fours and fives have been considered the, the LVOs or suspected LVOs. I added three, four, and five. So we kind of broaden that LAMS category. Um, and so the combination of BFAS and three, four, and five LAMS probably explains that fairly marked jump in the comprehensives. Actually, I'm sorry, just, just to go back to, to uh, the stroke scales. So you know, remember, we're big, right? So, so we said uh, 1,600 personnel, 900 paramedics. For us to change things is, is tough. You know, and I know there's always kind of a concept out there is, is LAMS the best severity scale and, and, and what have you. There's race. and I know there's a couple others. For us to make changes, it's a big undertaking. And so we always have to kind of weigh the effort is, you know, is, is the effort worth what we're going to get out of that? Um, I, I currently feel, um, you know, that, that the LAMS, the BFAS and LAMS is getting us where we need to be. We're, we're not missing significant uh, strokes. If, if another stroke scale comes along that shows markedly improved uh, accuracy compared to LAMS, we'll, we'll consider it. But to, to basically change, I've seen some statistics where, you know, race might be points uh, higher in, in terms of accuracy. That's not going to be worth the effort for us to uh, train uh, 1,600 personnel. Uh, so, so that's kind of where we stand today. Um, but again, you know, part of the collaboration is all the hospital systems in Jacksonville work with us. And, you know, we have our own training academy and then we're even running training out of headquarters now as well. But all the hospitals offer on a fairly regular basis the, the ability to, hey, can we come to your station? Can you bring guys to our hospital? And we'd love to teach you stroke and show case reports and things like that. So we do have this good collaboration. So we have this for, force multiplier uh, for training uh, with all the hospital systems out there. Um, and everybody wants to kind of, you know, show their wares and, and show their success stories and all that. And, and again, as a community, we're, we're trying to raise the bar for everybody. So some demographics about the strokes uh, by age over the past five years, you know, really not, not much has changed you know, kind of typical bell curve as, as one would expect. Uh, this was a little interesting. So, so we looked at, you know, in terms of race. And so if, if you look at uh, the uh, census data, African-Americans typically comprise about 31% of uh, the city of Jacksonville. So for them to have higher levels of strokes uh, probably does at least show some uh, you know, implication of uh, some healthcare disparity since they're, they're more, uh, uh, unfortunately, more represented in stroke alerts than, than what their uh, actual population uh, is. This was interesting too. Uh, we, we looked at uh, gender and this is repeatedly over the past five years. Um, unfortunately, women have more stroke alerts than men, you know, and uh, one would have thought this would have kind of normalized, uh, you know, over five years or something like that. But every year uh, we see this trend. So, so somewhat interesting. Uh, actually, I also need to give credit to uh, Lieutenant Mark Rowley. He's, he's one of our data experts and he did a lot of this data. Uh, so I have to thank him. But uh, this is a pretty interesting map too. Uh, looks at all the stroke alerts. And so we were able to kind of GPS locate uh, where they are. Uh, we also overlaid uh, the comprehensive stroke centers, and we see that we, you know, again, we're, we're very fortunate to have multiple stroke centers and somewhat spread out geographic, and then typically that's how our transport referral patterns go, is typically, uh, you know, we're not really bypassing one stroke center to get to the next in terms of the comprehensives. We are, we are very clear in going, you know, taking a pro going past a primary stroke center to get to a comprehensive, especially when it's warranted. So a couple other you know, additional considerations, um, you know, stroke care begins at the time people call 911 dispatch. So we have a computer aided dispatch, the CAD, uh, our, our, our 911 dispatchers are asking questions. So we're already trying to assess the nature of the call. Is that person having a stroke? 
and then based on this uh, CAD uh, program, we're able to identify at least a suspicion that the nature of the call could be a stroke. And so then this gives the responding crews uh, heads up information. So, you know, whether it's, hey, I'm going to a stroke, and so uh, let me refresh what BFAST is and what LAMS is. So, you know, let me, let me look at that. Let me know where I'm going in relative to the locations of the primary and comprehensive stroke centers uh, once that decision's made. Uh, Pre-hospital communications. We have uh, actually, uh, JFRD and Baptist uh, did partner uh, with this uh, pre-notification uh, trial. And, and so, you know, we learned that uh, by giving the LAMS and the onset time uh, ahead of time uh, to, to, the, to the ER, that the pre-alert notifications would go out to the, the stroke team. Uh, and that ultimately resulted in uh, greater efficiency and, and, and better workflow. Uh, working with our uh, HIPAA uh, compliance officer, as well as the city legal, we've also learned that we can give uh, the patient's name, date of birth, and the lambs over the radio. We use encrypted radios, but that information can be uh, broadcast to help facilitate pre-registration. And again, with an effort to try to improve that workflow and efficiency. Just as, as Dr. Neiman mentioned, you know, we are starting to develop this regional stroke dashboard and have this uh, Northeast Florida uh, Regional Stroke Coalition across the state, you know, the Florida State, uh, there's a Florida Stroke Registry. And so we've, you know, been asked to participate regionally as well. Uh, some of these other regions have uh, been, you know, quite aggressive and been in place for a couple of years. And there's some big significant benefit uh, to that collaboration. Uh, Orlando, South Florida, Tampa, they're all. Uh, uh, on board with this, and, and we're getting together. You know, we're kind of in the infancy stage of that, but you know, all the different health systems are participating. Uh, EMS is at the table, so ideally, this is a safe space to uh, exchange best practices and uh, share, uh, uh, you know, updates as well as you know, have journal club type uh, discussions and things like that. Um, ideally, at some point, there will be some. A blinded data uh, that is shared amongst the uh, the hospital providers uh, based on a number of the uh, stroke metrics, um, and that that's intended for the EMS medical directors to you know understand the various uh, hospitals' uh, performance. Um, so, uh, telemedicine, uh, another kind of interesting topic in in relation to EMS. Uh, it's been tried here uh, in in Jacksonville, actually, uh, some other agencies, not us. Uh, partnered with the uh, health system, the benefit really wasn't there for us, you know, that, that we could see. Uh, again, in the city of Jacksonville, we're very fortunate to have such significant stroke resources uh, that this benefit really didn't play out here locally. But I, I do think there is a role for telemedicine, particularly in the, in the rural environment, uh, to have that ER physician or that neurologist perform a, a stroke assessment on a patient in the back of a rescue unit uh, that has triage implications. Does that patient need a primary stroke center? Does it, do they need a comprehensive? Do we need to call for an air ambulance? You know, so, so I think that that uh, telemedicine is something to consider in the future uh, with EMS. I just think it's not really has, has a place, at least right now, a place in an urban uh, metropolitan environment. I also think the mobile CT scan kind of falls in that same category for me. Um, we were approached a uh, couple of years ago uh, to, to trial it. It just, we couldn't, uh, there were some logistic hurdles that, that we couldn't uh, overcome. But again, I, I think uh, for our surrounding counties, uh, St. John's to the south, uh, Clay County to the west, Nassau to the north, those I think might be better suited. Uh, they have a significant drive time um, to be able to get a scan and TPA sooner uh, might benefit. I, I don't see how it would work here in Jacksonville, but I do think there's value in it, uh, but always the challenge. If you put it more rural, how often does it get utilized, you know, uh, versus you put it in a place, you know, where we're doing 150 stroke alerts a month. So, you know, that, that's the challenge. Uh, we just uh, ran into uh, kind of operational issues in the very early pre-planning stages of staffing, so who, which hospital systems providing the radiology, who's providing the neurology consult, 
which hospital now do you have to go to? You know, and it's just, at least at that time, it was just one unit. And so, you know, where do you put that unit? And so that, that just became too much of a challenge for us. And at the end of the day, we're very fortunate again, we've got four strong comprehensive stroke centers scattered throughout the city. Would you rather be brought right to a comprehensive or have this? So, and that's, a, that's up for debate. I understand that. But I think for us, Jacksonville Fire Rescue, this wasn't for us right now. Um, that's basically all I got. Um, hopefully I wasn't too fast, but uh, uh, I understand the timing. So.